Welcome back to the Starting Strength series uh, where we talk to people that are important. One of the good things about my job is that uh, we get to bring people in here who are meaningful to me in terms of my history in the strength sports and coaching and competing. And uh, this is an opportunity I wouldn't otherwise have if it weren't for you people buying our books and paying attention to what we do. So for you, I, for you, I uh, am very appreciative. And this is uh, one of these kind of examples of the thing that gives me a great amount of pleasure in terms of uh, being able to present people to you. And it is with a great deal of pleasure that I welcome Joe Ladner Thank to you. the Starting Strength Series. Joe, you're about to learn about Joe if you don't know. And uh, Joe, thanks for coming. Joe lives in Mississippi now. Thanks for having me. Joe, how many times did you win? Let's get the credentials out of the way. How many times did you win the seniors back in the 80s? The USPF seniors one time. In 83. 83. We're going to talk about that meet because it, is, because it is one of the seminal moments in powerlifting history in the United States as far as I'm concerned. It was an amazing lineup and it was an amazing meet for Joe. Uh, other titles? Um, <coughs> I won the Teenage Nationals three times. Uh, compete When I won the USPF Senior Nationals, I was also a teenager. Mm -hmm. So um, the records then, they were men's world records at the times, but they were also teenage world records, and I still hold the teenage world records 27 years later, 29 20, years 29, later. 29, yeah. yeah long time ago. Joe started off early and uh, he was very, very strong back at a very young age, all through the early 80s. Joe was a dominant force in American powerlifting up through 86, 87. Injuries ended a career that uh, at that level that Marty Gallagher sh said to me on the phone the other day should have eclipsed that of Ed Cohen. That's wow. what he said about you. And uh, Joe, where did you come from? Did you just, were you born strong? You were had to have started training when you were very young. I was 15 years old. I, um, I was actually playing football when, when I started with sports, I was in elementary school uh, running track and field, and I was trying to find my niche. And um, uh, I uh, played baseball, played football, ran track. And then one year after uh, football season, um, the coach came to me and said, uh, we're going to go to a powerlifting meet, high school powerlifting meet. I said, okay, I had no clue what powerlifting was. Mm -hmm. We go to the other school and he, uh, we're sitting in the audience, stadium seating, and they have the platform set up, no warm up area. And uh, coach comes up to me and says, Joe, I got you down to squat 350, can you do it? And I said, what's a squat, coach? <laughs> and he, uh, he mimics a bar on his back, squats down and comes up. And he pointed at the platform and I said, okay. So I went up there with no warm-ups, no belt, no nothing, and got under and three fifty. Having had never done the movement, before. never done the movement, and uh, squatted three fifty, and more or less <laughs> did a good morning with it. And uh, I came back and I told coach, I said, I don't like that, coach. I don't want to do that no more. <laughs> and uh, then oh, he God. said, uh, I got you down to bench three hundred pounds. Can you do it? And I said, with free weights. And he said, Yeah. I said, Coach, I've never lifted on free weights. All we have back at the stadium is the machines. And I said, uh, I've done the, the stack, 275 pounds, 10 times with one arm. And I said, I don't know what I can do with free weights. And he said, oh, you'll be able to do 300. This is a typical high school football <laughs> Exactly, coach, <isn't> <laughs> exactly. And I wound up, I, I did 300, 315, and 325 at the meet. Oh, God, oh, man. At 165. I only so weighed you, 160. So you like that? Though, yeah, right? I like that. Yeah, I that told him, fine. I said, I like that, Coach. I want to I want to keep benching. I'll do that again. And then he came up and said, uh, Joe, I got you down to deadlift 430. Can you do it? We need that for the win. 
And I said, I don't know, Coach, what's a deadlift? <laughs> so he mimics a bar, <laughs> he wasn't, stands up with He hadn't it. been real helpful between the lifts. <laughs> and, and I'm doing these with no warm-ups at all. Right. No gear, no warm-ups at all. And I walk up on stage, and I did a stiff leg deadlift with 430 pounds. And Weighing 165. 160, and, and won the meet, won best lifter of the meet, and had no clue what I had just done. <laughs> well... Joe, I think it's probably safe to say that you have the genetics for this sport. Yeah. Um, is, and genetics and, and a combination of good genetics and training and motivation make for the level of athlete that you've become. Thank you. So you've, you've competed in both powerlifting and physique basically yes. for a long time. Haven't 30 you? years. Still in competition. What are your best recent lifts? I just competed this past February and uh, squatted 700 pounds with knee wraps and a belt. And this is having had two complete repairs on your knee. On the same knee. On the, the same right knee. knee. Yeah. Um, I I quit competing and semi-retired in 2009, and um, I, I was really just burnt out with the gear and and all that, trying trying to learn the new gear and all. And, mm -hmm. I came back, my son started competing, or started training again. My son's 21. He started training again and uh, talked me into training with him. And after about three months, he said, have you th ever thought about competing again? And I said, no, nah, I'm done with it. And he said, well, what about raw? He said, you've never done it raw. He said, when you, when you competed years ago, he said, that was almost raw. And he said, now, you know, <laughs> Due to the, and he said, now it's coming back, you know, it's making a big comeback. Oh. And he said, all the meets I see you going to, there's a lot of raw lifters with knee wraps and a belt. So I gave it a shot last October at my state meet, and I had a blast. It was fun again. Yeah. And yeah. Um, um, now I'm starting to look toward numbers, you know, just like mm -hmm. I did years ago. And, and I totally wiped out of my head what I had done before. And now it's all new to me again, mm -hmm. and I'm chasing numbers, and I'm I'm actually having right. fun. I'm enjoying it. Right. Now, on the phone with you about a month ago, you told me about a triple bench that you had done a triple at five. Five fifty-five. Fifty-five for yeah. a triple in yeah. a t-shirt. Yes, tank top. Well, Joe, that is in excess of what you were doing previously, isn't it? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I did a set of five with more than I'd ever done. So that was a PR triple and a PR set of five. I did 525. A lifetime five. PR. Yes. And I'm 50 years old now. Joe, that's just, that's just amazing. But after all, you are Joe Ledner. So let's just get this out of the way. We'll put it up front and get it out of the way. What, what's your opinion of, a, of equipment versus raw lifting, the way it's the way it's evolved and this is always something we want to talk about because it's kind of a pet peeve of mine but we're going to get this out of the way and then we've got all kind of fun stories to talk about i think it's has its place um i i don't i don't see that it's bettered the sport um <laughs> it, I, I think it separated the sport more than anything. Um, I think I, it, in I, fact, has. It's yeah, exactly. Um, I, you know, I didn't compete at all during the 90s. I, I was raising my family, and when I made a comeback in, in 99 and 2000, I was using gear that was 10 years old. And I was seeing all this new gear, and it was blowing me away, you know, these... Uh, denim bench press shirts and these canvas suits and the long wraps and the, the velcro straps on the suits and I mean it was it it was like I'd went through a time warp yeah you know because during the 90s um, I didn't I didn't go around the sport at all I didn't open a magazine I didn't go right. to a contest nothing I, I trained I never stopped training but I just stayed away from the competitive edge right. and um, so when I started competing again, I tried to get accustomed to the new gear, and I just I couldn't do it. Um, right. I couldn't get the the briefs. Um, I, I squatted 700 pounds just with the briefs on, no knee wraps, just a belt mm -hmm. and the briefs on, um, which you know 
blew my mind. I couldn't imagine what I could have done if I could have right. got used mm -hmm. to the gear. And then I tried putting the, the canvas suits on and the extra heavy duty suits on on top of that. And I just, I'm a hip squatter and I, there was no way I could do it. I just, I couldn't adjust. I tried and tried and tried. So when I would compete, I would wear just a hardcore sing, single layer suit, mm -hmm. no, no briefs or nothing, and compete against these other guys that were wearing the multi-ply gear. You know, I squat at 850, but I was happy with it. I made it up on the bench in the deadlift, mm -hmm. but um, now after I hurt my knee again in uh, 2003, I uh, took some time off full meets and started concentrating mainly on the bench press there for about three years. And I did get accustomed to the multi-layer shirts mm -hmm. and wound up benching 825 pounds in the um, the heavy duty shirts. At the time, what would you say your raw bench was? I really don't know because I had like three different styles of shirts I would wear during my workouts. Mm -hmm. I would, anything over 400 pounds, I would wear this shirt. Anything over 600 pounds, I'd wear this shirt. Anything over 800 pounds, I'd wear this shirt. Mm -hmm. Just more support at each level. Right. Um, I never would concentrate on my raw lift during that time. What would you guess it to be? Could you bench 550? Oh, no. No, no Maybe 500 pounds. 500 converted yeah. up to an 820. Yeah, 825. That's an interesting observation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. to say the least. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And my theory at the time was if, um, you know, if you're going to compete in gear, you need to train in gear. Sure. Because you're sure. trying to perfect that right. gear. Right, because that's the sport. Exactly. And I, that's the mistake I made long, long years ago. I never trained in my gear, and I wasn't very good with right. it. Right. But, uh, well, that's interesting. That's interesting. Um, but I think that was my downfall also because after trying to concentrate on my bench press so much and for so long with the gear, pounding my joints day in and day out with that extra heavy weight, right. I think that's why I burn out because by 2009, I was so beat up that just getting out of bed was a chore. I mean, sure. every bone in my body was hurting. Well, that's a hell of a lot of compression. Exactly. On your knees, your spine, your yep. shoulders, your wrists, elbows, everything. It's just a hell of a lot of compression. Yeah. And that's probably one of the primary reasons why raw lifting is enjoying such a big comeback right now, because it's just, it's not suicide. Right, right. You know, it's not slow suicide. Yeah. Sometimes fast suicide, but that's. I just, I don't think the, the multi-layer uh, equipment has very longevity with the lifter you know right. um, I, I think it, it cuts your your competition span short um, there's no way I could be doing this after 35 years right. if I would have been a multi-layer lifter all my life right and that is an extremely important observation yeah I mean you are the guy that started back in 1978 and have lifted all the way through and have a perspective on this that very few people have got. And uh, I think that uh, is advice for you guys to, to take seriously. Uh, raw lifting is, is enjoying to come back and we recently sponsored the, the raw USAPL meet up at the Arnold. And I was extremely happy to see that. It was a, everybody had a great time. They did a great job running this meet. And it was like it was a long time ago. Just the guy and iron and strong. I was, it was a pleasure to be associated with it. Listen, tell us about uh, your history in this sport. Um, I remember I, yeah, and I followed Joe's career through the magazines and, and uh, uh, actually watched him lift in the uh, 1983 seniors, the meet that I was, uh, was at for my referee evaluation for the USPF and uh, watched Joe lift at that meet, but you had gotten started in Mississippi with Larry Plumley. Uh, in 78, is that what it 79. was? 79. 79. Yeah, actually the, the high school meet I was referring to earlier, Larry was one of the judges there. And after I competed, he stopped me and said, uh, he goes, son, you got a, uh, 
you got a lot of potential. He said, how would you like to lift on our team? And I said, what team's that? And he said, the Mississippi Ironmen. And I said, I, I don't know, I'll think about it, you know. And a few weeks later, I just happened to be in the neighborhood and I was driving by, they trained at a spa, in the back of a spa, mm -hmm. and the door was open, and as I drove by, I had my windows down, and I could hear the weights clanging. And I said, oh, that must be that place. So I stopped and I went in, and as soon as I went in, I knew I was home. It was just, uh, it was amazing. Recognized the oh, place, yeah. huh? Absolutely. Yeah, that's cool. A month later, I competed in my first AAU meet as a 165er, and I think I squatted with suit wraps and belt, I think I squatted 475. I benched somewhere around 330 and then deadlifted 500 pounds. At 165. At 165, yeah. Mm -hmm. With a month of training. And then just went on up from there. How yeah. long were you with Larry? I was with Larry from, uh, well, <laughs> actually off and on all my life, but during that time, we were together from 79 to 82. And then 82, that's when I moved to Ohio. And to, with the other Larry. Larry. Another LP. <laughs> LP. Larry Pacifico. Yeah. Uh, let's talk now about his team and your, your situation up there. You uh, uh, trained with the famous Larry Pacifico, who was uh, a superstar bodybuilder, uh, a powerlifting coach, and in fact, an amazing meat promoter. And... Uh, one of the one of the tragic things that happened to powerlifting back then, Larry was Larry had a lot of problems, but Larry was an incredible meat promoter, and Larry yeah, was. was doing a great job of promoting powerlifting as a sport throughout television to the United States, and Absolutely. was doing a great job of causing a whole bunch of interest in this fledgling sport back in the back in the early '80s and uh, had a big team, had money, had sponsorships, had everything everybody needed, had the, had the connections with the, with the networks. Oh, yeah. And then something happened. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that situation? I wasn't involved with him then. Uh, I just knew through the great grapevine what had happened, you know. Um, but I, I've, I'd like to talk about how I got introduced to Larry. Let's, yeah, we, we're, we're going to examine that whole thing. I want to talk about about Larry's team, and I also want to talk about Black's Health World, mm -hmm. which was another famous powerlifting team that Joe was a was a part of at the time. So, how'd you end up running into Larry? In 1982, I competed in the uh, Mississippi State Meet and totaled, I believe it was 1810 at the time at 198, and um, uh, Larry Plumley. Uh, had decided that he was going to compete in the Senior Nationals in Dayton, Ohio in 82. And uh, Fred Hatfield was a good friend of Larry's. Fred lived over in New Orleans during that time. Mm -hmm. And matter of fact, uh, Fred had come over to the very first meet that I competed in, the AEU meet, and did a seminar, a squatting seminar. And that was the first place I'd ever met Fred. Fred was in New Orleans with uh Several good lifters at the time. Joe Bradley was with him. Joe Bradley, Ronnie and, Wilson, and uh, Ronnie Noonan. Ronnie lifter. Noonan, I remember him. Yeah, I remember Ronnie Noonan. I remember seeing Joe Bradley squat 650 at 132. Exactly. At yeah. the uh, at the Worlds, the IPF Worlds in 1980, and that was. I don't know that that's been done since then, has it? <coughs> Multiply. But this was a, yeah, this was not the equivalent. Right. That right. was a far below parallel, 650 at 132. I remember. What an amazing thing. And Fred was with him there. Yeah. I remember yeah. that. Yeah, well, they decided to lift in the Senior Nationals, and uh, they were going to rent a Winnebago and drive to Dayton, Ohio. And they talked me into going with them just for the experience. So, well, I bet uh, that was an experience, wasn't it? I told him, I said, well, since I'm not going to be competing, you know, I'll drive you all so you can rest in the Winnebago. So I drove the whole 17-hour drive to Dayton, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And we get there, and when we get there, Fred looks at me and said, didn't you qualify for the seniors at the state meet? And I said, yeah. 
and he said, well, why don't you lift? And I said, well, I didn't bring any gear or anything. I just drove 17. Now. And he said, uh, he goes, oh, don't worry about gear. We'll get you gear. So they asked some people and got me a belt and some wraps and a suit. And I got up the next morning, made weight, and wound up competing in my first senior nationals. <laughs> I was 18 years old. And uh, I bombed out in the deadlift, and I think it was due to fatigue. My back was fatigued from right. driving. But uh, if I would have pulled my opener deadlift, I would have got third place in the 198 pound class to oh, senior man. nationals. <laughs> and that's how I met Larry Pacifico, because yeah. after the award ceremony, one of his guys came up to me and said, um, Mr. Pacifico wants to talk to you. And I said, what for? And he says, uh, he wants to talk to you about something. So I walked up to him and I said, uh, Mr. Pacifico, you wanted to speak to me, sir? And he said, he goes, yeah. He said, uh, how would you like to come up to Dayton, Ohio and train on my team and work for me? And I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the time, that was probably an offer that not a lot of young guys would well, ever have been it's funny because subject to. Cause that's, uh, I, was, I was going to college at the time, a local junior college, and I was working at the local shipyard. And I told my roommate, I, I moved out of the house when I was 16 years old. And uh, during this time, I, I lived right by the college. I had an apartment. And I told my roommate, I said, um, I'm going to go to this meet up here in Ohio. And if, if I don't get any offers up there, I'm going to come back and join the Marine Corps and mm -hmm. get out of this place. <laughs> and lo and behold, I got the offer. Right. And. Uh, the sport was different after that, wasn't it? After that, absolutely. Oh, My eyes were opened up. Well, at the time, Larry Pacifico was uh, probably the greatest lifter in the in the sport in terms of placement, in terms of his own placement, in terms of his team success, and certainly in terms of promoting the sport. Nine-time world champion. That's. An amazing record. Yeah. Amazing record. He was an amazing lifter. Yeah. Commentator. Oh, he was he promoter. was very important to the sport. Arthur, yeah. Very important to the sport. And uh, he was uh, he was quite a guy. Controversial figure, but but uh, terribly important to the history of powerlifting. How did you and Larry get along? We got along great um, at first. <laughs> we had a falling out there at the end, but um, a lot of people do in in that kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. um, it, it it started out as a, a coach and lifter relationship, but it became more of a fatherly type relationship. He mm -hmm. he uh, he he was giving me a lot of advice um, in different ways, um, you know, with my life and what I, directions I should take and this and that and. Um, we started butting heads in the gym when I was, the more I traveled and competed and the more I met, met other people and other lifters, I was getting other ideas and, and different directions I wanted to go with right. my life than what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. And we started butting heads and that's eventually where we had our falling out. Right. He managed your training at first though, Yes, right? yes. Well, during the whole time I was there in Dayton, he managed my training. Right. And really, Helped you, get my career off the ground. What do you remember about the training at the time? Very intense. Um, for the first three years that I competed, when I was with Larry Plumley, we trained basically, we first trained at the spa, but we got kicked out of there probably the first six months I was there, and we moved into... Um, you didn't have anything to do with that, did you? Well, it was just power lifters in general right. with chalk and right. loud and noise. Just, and they just got tired of it. <laughs> yeah. Power lifters aren't good for a gym environment. As Especially a, a spa. <laughs> a, a, any gym that's going to make a profit. They're, exactly. They're not helpful. For we wound up moving into one of the lifters' garage. Right. And that's where we trained for the next two and a half years was in his garage. So basically all we did was variations of the squat, variations of the bench press, variations of the deadlift. And that was the only work I did. I didn't do any other assistance work whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And made a lot of gains that way. Sure. A lot of gains. It's and just the uh, base strength, yeah. But then when I moved to Ohio uh, with Larry, I trained in a regular gym. And it was a hardcore gym, you know, uh, a typical meathead gym. 
and he introduced me to accessory work, more bodybuilding movements. And um, that's really where I harnessed my bodybuilding background right. um, as far as the, the movements go. Um, I can remember him, one of the first workouts after we, I, we had gotten through benching, he, um, he told me to go in there and do some alternating um, dumbbell presses overhead or military presser or something. I can't remember what yeah. he called them. And I walked in there and I didn't want to feel like an idiot. I had no idea what he was talking about. So <laughs> I, I walked in there and I was looking around and I was watching the other people. So I just started doing what other people were doing. And he came in there and he said, what are you doing? I didn't tell you to do that. <laughs> you didn't. Know. So uh, I, I uh. kind of under my breath, I said, you mind showing me what you're talking about? <laughs> Larry so, was big on the lying tricep extension. I remember him riding a lot yeah, about that. Yeah. Called it the fourth power lift. Yeah. Yeah, he was real big on that. Um, How much could he do on that exercise? Do you remember? You know, during the time that I was up there, Larry was trying to make a comeback for his 10th world title. Yeah. And um, he, he really pressed hard with his training. And uh, <sighs> when did he injure his hand? Do you it was remember before, that? It was before, before you got there. It was before I got there. I saw the video of when oh, he did Oh, he cut it. his finger off. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. That was, oh, God. Oh, God. He, he was yeah. bench pressing. <laughs> and For uh, those of you that don't know, he was racking a bar and got his finger. I think it was his ring finger. Well, from what I remember, he was bench pressing and blew his pec, and the bar fell. That's what it was. And, and, and his and hand got rack. caught, yeah, in the rack. In the rack. As That's he ducked what, out from under the bar. Oh, yeah, just chopped it, his finger off. And it all chopped his ring finger off. All the way off. Yeah. And they apparently reattached it, but it was. Yeah, they air flighted him to the hospital and brought the finger with him and yeah, reattached it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, horrible it's, accident. It's now like this. <laughs> right. Well, at least it's there. It's there. You know. It hindered his grip on the deadlift. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. But as far as Larry's training goes, I can't really remember exactly what movements he did. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even remember if it was because he trained separately from us. Right. He would squat, bench, and deadlift with us on a different platform. But as far as the accessory work, it was at, it was at a different time. So who else was on the team? Uh, John Topsiglou, a 165er. Uh, Tim Martin. Famous lifter, Topsiglou. Tim Martin, yeah. a 275er. He was actually my training partner and was probably one of the best training partners I ever had. Weight-wise, we, mm -hmm. were, we were real close in our weights and our numbers. Um, Christina Papalius, she was the only female on the team at the time. And um, Eric Stuber, who was er uh, Larry's training partner. And then Sean Scully. And Mark Chalet, who also worked for Larry at the time, he would come down and lift with us every now and then. He lived in uh, Sandusky, Ohio. Right. Or, no, Kokomo. He lived in Kokomo, Ohio. Wasn't he from Pennsylvania, though? Yes, yes. That's what I thought I remember. He came over and was working for Larry. Larry was vice president of um, New Life Fitness Centers, a chain of mm -hmm. health clubs in Indiana and Ohio. There was 19 of them. And... Um, me and Mark both worked for him at two different ones. Mm -hmm. What'd you guys do? Mark was the manager at the one he was at, right. and I was just a trainer at the one I was at just in Indiana. Floor trainer. Yeah. Right. Uh, tell us about. I, I know this will be a, a, an inter, of interest to the people watching. You told me that Louis Simmons came down one time, and that's where you first saw Louis Simmons. One yeah, year. Louis. Um, it was before Louis, um, I guess before he had a gym and all, but he, uh, it was before he, he was famous in, in the sport. Um, I had never heard of him, and uh, he was just this little ball guy that would come in with a handlebar mustache curled up and <laughs> go sit in the corner and watch us train. He just, he just sat there. Just sat there. He never talked or, you know, he, he just sat there and watched us train. And it, <laughs> I, just, I can remember that clear as day, but uh, it was so strange because I, I never saw him work out. I never saw him uh, talk to anybody. He just he he would come in the door and he wouldn't say anything to anybody. He'd just go sit in the corner and watch his train. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, uh, good. So how long were you at Pacificos? Right at two years. Right at two years. And um, after I competed in the uh, 83 World Championships in Gothenburg, Sweden, um, Larry had um, came over to the meet, um, I guess, as my coach for the World Championships, which, you know, the, the world team, you have, they have a coach, right. which was Doyle Kennedy at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't expect Larry to be going, but he went, and um, he was kind of in the background the whole time, but he made, a, he made a call on my deadlift, which cost me the meat, and that's... Larry did. Yeah, and that was kind of... Pick the wrong number. Yeah, you. that was kind of the, our falling out right mm -hmm. there, because that, I kind of blew my top with that. But, well, he wasn't listening to you. Um, me and Doyle kind of had a game plan. Right. I had went to weigh in the night before the, the <clears throat> contest and ran into Doyle, and we stayed down there talking for hours. And uh, our game plan was, because I had to compete against Hatfield again after beating him at the Senior Nationals, um, he was the alternate chosen to go for the World Championships. So uh, my main competition was going to be uh, another U.S. teammate, mm -hmm. again, <laughs> which I yeah. didn't think was very fair, but anyway. Um, my game plan was I knew Fred was going to out-squat me. I knew I was going to out-bench him. And then it was going to come down to the deadlift, right. and we were neck and neck in the deadlift. Mm -hmm. uh, but nine times out of ten, after the bench, I was going to be ahead in subtotal. So all I had to do was pull the same thing Fred pulled, and I would win. That was our game plan. Right. And it was a simple game plan, and it would have worked. But from my opening attempt, Fred jumped, and I, I, I can't remember what the num numbers were at the time, but I want to say um, I opened with like 650. Fred went 688. And then um, all I had to do was pull the next – Numbers Fred pulled, and I would have won and the meet. Stay with him because I would have beat him. By, I was ahead in subtotal. Well, Larry jumped me all the way up to 722, which I knew was out of my range at the time because I didn't have a real good deadlift cycle that time. And um, um, I wound up missing 722 on my second and third attempts, and we tied. Fred and I tied. And uh, the way the IPF rules are, if you tie, Body whoever weight. whoever weighed the lightest mm -hmm. wins the wins the meat. And Fred weighed one quarter of a pound lighter than me. And that's uh, I can tell you to this day that is the suckiest way to lose a sure, meat sure. ever by a quarter pound of body especially weight. the world yeah. championships. Yeah. Oh God, almighty. Oh my. <laughs> Because Fred always claims that he beat me, which he didn't beat me. No, we tied. He tied, <laughs> and he happened to have a quarter pound less urine in his bladder at the time <laughs> exactly. he woke. Right? God almighty. What a terrible deal. <laughs> what a terrible deal. So what, what do you think Larry's motivation for that was? What was he thinking? Did he not understand? This is kind of inside baseball, but did he not understand that you and Doyle had this thing wired? I, I really I really don't think Larry had any bad intentions. I, I really don't. Larry felt like I was his boy. You know, mm -hmm. he had brought me to where I'm at now. Right. And so he wanted to be the one to make the contribution, make I, the call. I, I think. Right. I think that was his intentions. You know, I really don't think he had any ill intent at all. Um, well, I can't imagine. But that at the time, been, it pissed me off. Oh, well, I bet it did. <laughs> I bet it did. <laughs> God almighty. When I heard him call that number out, I was like, what? I didn't call for that. Yeah. You know, I was going to pull the same thing Fred pulled and win. Right. But anyway. <laughs> Amazing. So this is 83, and you were, you were yeah. a 220. Right. Now, and depending on how much time you think this is going to take, I want to talk about the 83 seniors in Austin that year. And... Uh, I don't know, maybe we can talk a while about that. Maybe we'll just leave that for part two of the interview. Okay. So let's, you know, let's, let's just save that. This will be something you guys need to just, we're going to run several parts of this interview. Stay tuned, okay? So, after you left Pacifico, where'd you go? <clears throat> well, on the plane ride back from Sweden, 
that was probably the longest plane ride I've ever oh, had in my life. Mm -hmm. I was extremely pissed off and depressed and you name it. And uh, I wound up sitting next to Buddy Duke. Buddy Duke was our 198 pound uh, senior national champion that year. And if you don't know anything about Buddy Duke, he, uh, he came out of the blue uh, way behind in subtotal and came out and pulled, I think, an 810 deadlift at 198 to win the meet and uh, just blew everybody away and uh, really opened up everybody's eyes. And that's when he got the nickname the Iceman, you know. And mm -hmm. um, Anyway, he, he didn't have a good day at the World Championships. I, I don't remember what he placed, but um, I think he placed like fourth or whatever. He had a very bad day, and he was down in the dumps too on the ride back, and we happened to sit next to each other. And we got to talking, and um, he was asking me what my plans were. He said, well, what are you going to do now, you know? And I was like, man, I really don't know. You know, I'm, I'm getting pulled every which direction possible. I said, I got, I got several magazines that are talking to me. I got, you know, uh, I got a few offers up north. I got a few offers out west. Joe Weeder wanted me to come out there. Um, Mark Schley wanted me to move over to Pennsylvania with him and his dad to open up a gym over there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Buddy said, well, look, if you just want to get out of the limelight a little while and uh, work on your training and stuff, he said, uh, why don't you come down to Georgia with me? And he said, you help me on my bench and I'll help you on your deadlift. And I said, sounds like a deal. So it wasn't but a couple of weeks that I up and left and I, I moved to Adel, Georgia. And which packed was, up all your stuff in a U-Haul and yep. rolled. <laughs> and um, it was like going back in time. I, I had never, <laughs> I had never seen. So I felt like I was in the 1950s. Oh, it, it, it blew me away. Um, buddy, in terms buddy, of the equipment and the gym, well, everything, and the, uh, the social the, atmosphere, the, the, the town, the everything. Right. Um, uh, buddy's family owned an ice house, which is another reason for the nickname yeah. Ice Man. Mm -hmm. um, his father had started an ice house, and he eventually took it over, and he ran. Um, all the farmers in the town, you know, the ice house was the most important thing. And uh, oh, I guess because they're they're greens they're, and vegetables. Yeah, and everything. truck farmers need to ask for the Ab for the absolutely. produce. Absolutely, yep. Right. So um, anyway, I moved to Georgia, and um, Buddy trained at the community center, what was called the community center, and it was basically. A little room that was the size of these three platforms <laughs> and it had a power rack a bench press and a deadlift platform and a homemade pull down machine right. that you stack plates on <clears throat> and that was our workout area and uh, <laughs> I lived there six months and I bet the whole six months me and buddy only worked out together maybe three times <laughs> Wow. Only because of his schedule. Right. He was so busy so much with the ice house and, and that, the farmers that and all that. It didn't work out like you'd intended, did no, it? No, not at all. I wound up training by myself most of the time I was there. I can remember one time training for uh, the Hawaii Invitational mm -hmm. in 84. Um, it, Gus, was, it was me. Gus Rethwich's meet. Yes, yes. For those of you who don't know, he's, um, that was a, a famous invitational meet in... Uh, in Hawaii that was held every year and promoted as kind of a private meet. It was kind of extra judicial kind of a situation in terms yeah, you, you of Yeah, you got a special invite from right. Gus. And I got invited that year and that's what I was training for. And I can remember one particular night that I was in there training out of a power rack um, and I squatted, I think I squatted 881 for, for a triple with just my girlfriend as a spotter. <laughs> she said, well, well, what do you want me to do if you miss it? I said, I guess go to the hospital. <laughs> get out of the way. <laughs> yeah. But well, that, that makes you not take stupid things out of the rack. Yeah, it? exactly. Makes you think yeah, about I was confident with it. I knew right. I could get it, you know. Right. It was a weight I had done before, mm -hmm. but, you know, I look back now and think, oh my God, I was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's another word. There's, 
I mean, you, if, if you're going to train by, and you, you don't always have control of your own, uh, perfect control of your training situation. Right. You have to train. Right. You just got to have some balls about you and just do it. And that's the, yeah. that's just all there is to it. Yeah. So. Well, I was in Georgia for about six months and um, <clears throat> I was still looking at all the offers and um, I actually spoke to Joe Weider on the phone one time. Um, and I, I believe Fred Hatfield was working for him during that time, and that's how the offer came up. Mm -hmm. He wanted me to go to San Jose, California, and work in a Gold's gym there um, with the reigning Mr. Universe, which was Scott Wilson at the time. And um, he wanted me to work as a trainer there and then bounce in a couple of nightclubs during the week <laughs> and live in a mobile home with 11 other bodybuilders. This is Joe's gig. The, yes. His idea yes. of the, the compelling <laughs> offer. Huh? I can't No, you know what? It wasn't Joe Weeder. It was Pete Gromkowski. Oh, oh, the, it, the yeah. new owner of Gold. Yeah. He, right? He's the one that wanted me to come out there. Right. All right. Um, he's the one that called me and gave me the offer to go out there. And uh, when he gave it to me, I was like, are you kidding? <laughs> you, <laughs> Why would I want to do that? <laughs> you, and he said, but we're talking California. And I said. <laughs> he thought, a kid from Mississippi. Yeah, exactly. How could he resist? Yeah. And I, I didn't even give it a second thought. <laughs> I, yeah, that's, I just that's said, that's uh, crazy. I said, I appreciate your offer. I said, but, you know, I'm. I, I I've kind of already got my own, like, house here. And yeah, stuff. I said, I'm, I'm not. I'm thinking about Florida. I'm not thinking about California. Rick Weil had had uh, contacted me, and uh, had talked to me about coming to work with him in Florida, doing seminars and exhibitions, and promoting a, a vitamin line that he was working on at the time, mm -hmm. and offered me pretty good money during that time. And uh, that's why what I wound up doing. I left I left Georgia and I moved down to Tampa, Florida, and started working with Rick, mm -hmm. and training at the famous Suncoast Gym. Dick Who Arm all was there? Um, well, Dick Armatrout was the owner. Uh, really, really good guy, good coach, very supportive, very pro powerlifting. Um, Rick Weil, of course, who who was a multi world record and holder in the bench press, uh, 165, mm -hmm. 181, 198, and 220. Mm -hmm. um, he he was just an extremely strong bencher, uh, very unique bencher. He benched close grip with his hands right on the knurlings. Uh, yeah. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. I'd hand off to him at a seminar, and if I was off at all with my hand off this way or this way, he would tear his pack. Oh, God. Oh, and man. he'd come back the next day and bench a world record. I, it was it was crazier <laughs> than anything I'd ever seen in my life. He had the I most remember seeing the pictures of that bench. Yeah. Because, you know, we just live for the magazine. So right, the magazine right. comes in and we're going, what the hell is he, why is he close grip mentioned in the meet? Yeah. Because to us that was an assistance exercise. Right, but right. Yeah, he made it work. He had the most unusual training philosophy and training cycle you had ever seen. That, that was what was so good about us doing seminars together because we were so total opposites mm -hmm. in everything we did. And then at the end of the seminar, we would do a bench off, you know, me and him. Mm -hmm. And he would weigh somewhere around 198. And of course, I was a 220 pounder. And we'd do like 500 pounds for reps on the bench. And <laughs> it'd really get the crowd going. No, you know, it, was, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> we did that for a while. And then um, I, um, I, I got involved in law enforcement. I became a police officer down there. And uh, I kind of branched off from Suncoast Gym and started training other gyms. And so this is while you were in Florida, you yes. went into law enforcement. Yes, I was down there for about five years. But that's during that time. The first year I was there in 1984, um, we won the uh, the team uh, championship team uh, uh, at the U.S. Senior Nationals, and. Um, Bob Krosniak, he, he was one of the lifters there, real good squatter. He squatted in, in the high eights at, at 242. Mm -hmm. um, his brother, I, I think his brother's name was Tim. He was a 198 or a 220. He competed on the team. Um, Virgil Diaz, I think he was a 181-er. He was on the team. Dave Wilkerson, he was an Air Force guy, but he was on the team. Uh, 
Mike Bacara, he was on the team. Uh, who else? I know there's probably several of them leaving well, out. Well, it's been a while. Yeah, it's been a little while, it's 30 been years. A while. <laughs> so you were in Florida for, for six years? For about five, five years. Five years, and yeah. then when did Black's Health World recruit you to During start the time I was in Florida, um, Mike Becerra, who he lived in, in, in Clearwater, Florida, I think at the time, he was a 165 pounder that I had become good friends with. We actually were working together. I got him a job at the Sheriff's Department, which coincidentally, he just retired from that Sheriff's Department. Same, um, same Sheriff's Department. Same Sheriff's Department, um, just recently. I <laughs> talked to him about six months ago, and he was he was retiring at the time after yeah. 25 years. Oh, yeah. But um, he was real good friends with John because John's John Black's sister lived by him in St. Petersburg, Florida. And John Black would come down to St. Petersburg to visit his sister, and they would all get together and train. So, and this is kind of how I got hooked up with John. So, for those of you that don't know, John Black's John Black was a guy that had a this. The gym was located in uh, Cleveland, in Cleveland, Ohio, another great Ohio powerlifting hub. John Black's, would sponsor Black's Health World. Black's Health World's the name of the of the, of the gym, and Black's Health World was the team as well, and he recruited lifters from all over the country to sponsor them to the meet right. uh, to lift on his team. How many of those guys actually trained at the gym in Cleveland? Or was it mostly made up of guys from all over the country? There there were several guys that trained there on the team. Uh, the ones I remember, John <coughs> Florio, Jack Sedaris, um, Steve Wilson, uh, his brother, I can't remember his brother's name, um, Danny Wollaber. Danny Wollaber, great he, deadlifter. He lifted on the team. Um, uh, Dave Waddington, he lifted on uh, the team. The Waddington was kind of a, he was kind of an icon on that team. Waddington was the one of the first guys in uh, in the sport to take a thousand pounds out of the rack. Yep. That happened at the 1980 Worlds. I remember that. That was a. That was quite. He dropped that on the spotters. Oh really? Oh God, it was a. It was a mess. <laughs> he he got halfway up on that thing and decided that he wanted out from under the damn thing. And there were there were four spotters around him, and it landed on a guy I knew landed on his leg. Oh man! It didn't didn't break it or anything, but. Sure was dramatic. Yeah, I bet it was. <laughs> it was quite a deal. Yeah, Waddleton was a star. He used to the Watt poke him all the time. But uh, yeah, that was a. They were they were quite a team there for yeah for, for uh, quite a while. And that you lifted for them from. I think so it was eighty five and eighty six. Eighty five, just two years. Yeah. Um, I um I blew my knee out in eighty six, uh, training for the the Hawaii meet again. And I, I was five weeks out from the meet when I had that that accident. But uh, now, when you say accident, we're talking about a catastrophic accident. What had actually? Well, I mean, did you after, separate the whole damn thing? What what actually happened? Hatfield. Well, it, it kind of goes back to the '85. Because this is important. Because this had, this changed your lifting career. For yes, quite, it did. For the rest of your life. Yes, and, it did. Um, in 85, um, I bombed out of the senior national in the squat. And um, uh, I kind of sat back and reevaluated things and decided I was going to train one year for the nationals again, for 86 nationals. Uh, and then Gus contacted me and wanted me to come to the Hawaii meet again. So I was looking at that as a vacation because the way Gus ran the meet was you train for the meet, you get there to the meet, pay all your expenses, you win the meet, then you, if you win the meet, you get reimbursed. Right. So it's kind of like a paid vacation. Right. And that's what if I was- If you won the meet. Right, and that's what I was looking at, you know, was uh, going to the meet and getting a paid vacation out of it. But I wanted to re, I was reevaluating my lifting and my style and everything. And since I was um, so so friends with Fred Hatfield and he was the guru of the squat you know mm -hmm. I started talking to him more and 
he uh, convinced me into squatting close stance instead of the real wide stance, which right. I had used for the first six years of my career. Well, the first time I started doing it, my numbers were just going through the roof. And uh, I remember the very first training cycle, I did 600 pounds for, for uh, 20 reps with, <laughs> with straps down on a suit and knee wraps. <laughs> and then um, it just went up from there. I did 700 for 10 reps. And then I did, I, I did uh, 881, which was my best triple at the time. I did 881 for five reps. And I said, I'm gonna squat a grand. This close stance that's is what, it. I'm going to do it. Would've. So the very next jump I made, I always had this thing about numbers when I would make 100-pound jumps, and I had to hit that big number and then to whatever my working set was. So I had to hit 900. That was just set in my head, mm -hmm. which I had squatted 960 wide in training. Right. And so I was confident that once I hit the 900, I could go to my 950 and hit my 950 triple. I went to 900 and uh, three quarters of the way down, just out of the blue, no knee pain at all. Never had knee problems. Warm. Just no I was inflammation. Warm. No nothing. No nothing. sun. Out of the clear blue sky. Boom! It blew. My patella tendon right right above the kneecap detached, flipped, went over here, and in the meantime, I, I tore the ACL and the MCL right. during the fall, and it shot me out from under the weight like a rubber band I hit my head on the rack and it knocked me unconscious I was on the ground and uh, and the bar somehow didn't fall on you I had nine spotters luckily that day but it went right through their hands it happened so Which, quick yeah, they, they can't react They're and just, it, you know they they wasn't used to me missing a weight right because I always got whatever I attempted right. they never had to catch a weight with right. me and this was totally out of the blue I mean totally unexpected well when I came to, they were putting smelling salts in, in, under my nose to get me to come to. And when I came to, you know, everybody was standing around me. When I turned my head, I hit my head on the weights. They were right here. The plates were right. Oh, God. That's how close it was. And uh, my leg, my right leg was up under me with the knee wrap on. Oh, God. I was laying on my, on my leg. Your quad had rolled up. No, my quad didn't roll, luckily. But How did it not, I mean, with the detached? I have no idea, but it did not roll. Wow. What happened was um, I was laying on the ground with, with my leg up under me, and they were started cutting all my gear off. They cut my suit off. They got mm -hmm. this knee wrap off. They took my left shoe off, and they pulled my leg out from under me to uh, take the knee wrap off. And as they were taking the knee wrap off, I started freaking out because I could feel something. And it was my kneecap you, you moving. You probably didn't know what had happened. The kneecap up to that was point. being held in place with the knee wrap. Right. But as they were unwrapping mm -hmm. it, it started to flip. And as the last wrap came off, it flipped under the skin. Right. And you could have oh, heard God. me scream three miles away. I mean, I went oh, ape shit. God Almighty. <laughs> I was swinging at anybody and everybody. Strangest that was feeling me. in the world. Uh, huh? It was. It was horrific. Well. um... They called an ambulance, an ambulance backed into the back of the gym. We had a roll-up door. They backed into the gym, picked me up, was carrying me off. This is at, at Suncoast? At right. Suncoast. Right. And uh, it was a 900-pound close stance squat that blew my knee. And the reason why it blew was because of the drastic change from the wide stance right. to the close and stance. This hadn't been enough time for the adaptation to occur. Right, right, right. I didn't, yeah. I didn't give it enough time for the knee to strengthen with that stance mm -hmm. so uh, anyway I can I can remember the paramedic talking to me trying to calm me down because she thought I was going into shock and I said lady I'm not going into shock I'm pissed off because I just ruined a paid vacation <laughs> <laughs> that was the primary concern oh, I God. said I tell you what I, I don't care if I have to go over there and bench in a cast I'm going to go over there and bench 600 pounds with a cast on my leg, yeah. you know, but I didn't. <laughs> my training totally changed after that. Oh, I'm sure. Well, a catastrophic deal like that usually changes I, a lot you of know, I've seen that happen twice at meets. I was head judge at a meet in Dallas one time when it happened standing in front of me, and I was announcing 
uh, a meet down in Austin when that happened back about, that would have been about, well, these are both back in the 90s, early 90s and the middle 90s. And that is just the, that's the kind of thing that you never forget when you hear it. Oh, yeah. Did you, do you remember the sound? Oh, that, yeah. It, sound, it, it, it sounded like amazing. a sheet shredding. <clears throat> just whoosh. The second one I heard sounded like a dry branch snapping. It was, and I was, the announcer's table was, uh, we were probably 50 feet from the platform. And you could hear it all over the room. And he fell down, Randall Deaver was the guy's name. He fell down, he had, he had high sevens on the bar. And he fell down under the bar. The spotter somehow kept him from getting killed. But we all at the table, myself and the expediter and the guy running the scoreboard, looked at each other and, and said, did you hear that? Oh my God, I'm gonna puke. You know, it was, I, it was it was a, it was the damnedest thing. I've seen it twice. It's a it's a hell of an injury. I've had it twice. I'd, I've done it twice. That's the bad. Well, thing about most it. guys don't get a chance to do it twice. Yeah. You know, I mean, these things are amazingly enough. They do heal. You can heal patellar tendon. We've had that happen in here once. A uh, guy ruptured his patellar tendon at work in here, and. Uh, was we had him back up to 315 for sets of five and five months post-op. Wow. So it, it happens, you can get back pretty quick. So, Mine was uh, more of a mental injury than sure, anything else sure. because of the, 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 w the way it happened. Yeah. And I, I used to yeah. wake up in cold sweats from nightmares just dreaming about it, it happening right. all over again, you know. Oh, and, I can and, imagine. Well, it was the, it's a big turning point for your, for your competitive career. Oh, and yeah, absolutely. And had, uh, had it not occurred, things would have been a lot different for the world of powerlifting. Two days before it happened, I did my first 600-pound bench press. See, things were just... At, at the uh, Florida State meet, Florida mm -hmm. bench press state meet. I, uh, I bench pressed 600 pounds weighing 232. Right. Things would have been different. We're going to come back in part two and discuss more of these things with Joe. Uh, we appreciate you watching us here on the Starting Strength series, and we'll continue this next time. Joe, thanks. Thank you. All right.